Welcome to week three of disease processes, where we're going to discuss the digestive and endocrine systems, as well as the liver, gallbladder, and pancreas. Here you'll see the list of our objectives. These objectives, I've kind of taken away the specifics because we're going over so many different um, organs and systems within this particular short lecture that I just want you to know the terminology, basic anatomy and physiology, important signs and symptoms, diagnostic tests we'll use, the most common disorders that you'll see associated with this, this um, particular lecture. For example, endocrine, one of the most common disorders we know about is diabetes. Um, we also want you to know the typical course in management for some of those common disorders and what the effects of our aging system have on those particular, not only just disorders, but just the organs and systems involved. Now let's look at the digestive system and its anatomy. Um, I'm not going to list all of the um, anatomical parts of the digestive tract that you can see there in the image. Um, you can review those and read those, but we will go over a couple of highlights. Um, so the digestive system is responsible um, for changing our food, the food that we eat into absorbable substances that will then move into our blood to be carried to the cells within our body. It basically is gonna give our cells energy energy based off of the breakdown of the food that we eat into substances that will be permeable or be allowed to move into our bloodstream. Um, it also eliminates waste products from the body. And it has two different areas. It has con the al alimentary canal and the accessory organs that help to facilitate its function. The alimentary canal is just the area from mouth to anus and the accessory organs that you see listed there help to continue in the furthering and the breaking down. Um, of the food that we eat, whether it be through chewing, um, through the saliva, excuse me, gallbladder, pancreas, and liver all working together to function. Um, the stomach's goal is to is the stomach is where the food is broken down. Um, and there is a chemical change that happens. Um, there's tons of hydro hydrochloric acid within the stomach um, that helps to facilitate that chemical change. Then we have the small intestine whose function is to it's digestion and absorption of food and fluids. Um, and that's where most of our digestion takes place. Now, the large intest intestine is also a place where digestion and absorption continue, but its major function really is the absorption of water and electrolytes and the elimination of feces or stool because those, those being feces and stool um, are not things that are absorbed by our intestine. So these are some general signs and symptoms of digestive um, diseases, hemorrhage being one. Whenever you see the word heme, a, that H-E-M, um, before um, a, a, or at, the, at the, the prefix of a word, always think bleeding or blood. So hemorrhage typically means excessive, an excessive amount of bleeding. So hemat hematemesis is uh, blood that is in our emesis or our vomit. Um, Hematochesa is the bright red rectal bleeding that is different from melana, which is a dark tarry stool or dark tarry um, bowel movement. Perforation of the digestive system means that there is some type of rupture um, or laceration that releases the contents that should be within um, our peritoneum outside into the actual abdominal cavity. That can lead to sepsis um, or septicemia, which is having that bacteria in your blood, which can be a very life-threatening um, condition. Uh, septicemia, once it starts, moves very, very fast um, and is very hard to treat because of the bacteria that's usually um, um, confined to the small intestine uh, or large intestine is not excreted in our abdominal cavity. Um, so when our body absorbs something that is considered waste, that can be very life-threatening. Other signs and symptoms will be altered mobility, thinking too fast, too slow. So our our digestive system um, has what we call peristalsis, which controls how fast we digest and how fast we eliminate. So we all know that diarrhea, for example, could be an altered uh, mobility of things moving too fast. And uh, constipation is an example of altered mobility when things are moving too slow. Um, 
two additional signs and symptoms that are often noted are nausea and vomiting. And then here we just mentioned um, diarrhea and constipation in our example of altered mobility. Diagnostic test associated with the digestive system. Um, again, here's another place where you're going to see lots of these tests overlap. Uh, X-ray just gives us a visualization of the digestive tract. Endoscopy is where they take a lighted scope and they will go down the esophagus um, to view the particular cavity where they want to look for um, disease or um, some type of um, impact on function. A barium swallow test is where the patient usually takes in some type, type of contrast or medium that provides visualization to the esophagus, stomach, and the upper small intestine. Again, we're looking for um, abnormalities within those structures. And then we have esophago duodenoscopy, which basically will give us a look at the esophagus, um, the gastric system, and the duodenum. Um, scope, anytime you hear scope or you see that scopy, that basically means we're looking to get a visualization. And then the ova and parasite examination is simply looking in the person's stool or bowel movement to determine if there's any presence of ova or parasite that could have been causing um, some of the signs and symptoms that they were facing. In terms of aging, um, cardiovascular changes we already know really affect the elderly person. So when there are cardiovascular changes already present, that can kind of spill over into the digestive system, as well as neurological symptoms. They both can dis disrupt the function. Um, loss of teeth is something that we all know to happen naturally, um, but oftentimes because of their inability, because remember, that's an accessory organ. Because of that inability to break that food down, it can often cause upper GI problems in our elderly. And then they have the decreased everything, decreased sense of taste, decreased mobility in their esophagus, decreased development of hydrochloric acid, which then changed the lining of their stomach. So it, uh, acid in our stomach really kills off things that... Um, that, that could be harmful. And so when you have a decreased amount of that, it alters the lining or the, the barrier within the stomach. Decreased circulation to the stomach, that can cause an increase in ulcers or ulcer disease. Um, and then lastly, there's this decreased absorption of nutrients. Uh, for example, vitamin B12 is one of our vitamins that gives us energy. So there's a decreased absorption of that as well as fat. So um, that's why sometimes you see a lot of elderly who are frail um, because their body has this decreased absorption of its own nutrients. So now we'll talk about the liver, pancreas, and gallbladder anatomy. The liver is the second largest organ. Um, it comes in second to uh, skin, which is the largest organ in the body. It plays a major role. As you can see here, we got digestion, absorption, metabolism, clotting, uh, manufacture of chemicals, and the storage of nutrients. It also produces fibrinogen and prothrombin. Um, prothrombin, those are both to help our blood clotting. It converts glucose to glycogen for storage that helps to give us energy. And one of the most important is it is a detoxification of many drugs and other toxins. So whenever we take a medication, it goes through the liver's process of digestion in order to ensure that we are not overdosed or that the drug is therapeutic in its use. Uh, we also have the gallbladder, which lies under the liver. Um, it is the transport place for bile to get to the duodenum. And lastly, we have the pancreas, which is behind the stomach, but between the duodenum and the spleen. And it's one of the organs that's both endocrine and exocrine um, in its gland formation, in so much that with the endocrine portion of it, we know that it secretes various hormones. But the exocrine component of it is the establishment of the digestive enzymes um, that we need to further break down our nutrients. Common signs and symptoms with these disorders you'll see is jaundice, which is the yellowish skin discoloration. That one is more directly pertaining to issues with the liver. Um, whenever the liver goes down, um, there are issues with bile 
and um, the issues with bile kind of run into the gallbladder, but can also cause that discoloration um, in a person's skin. Most people with uh, issues with liver, gallbladder, or pancreas will complain of abdominal pain. Um, that pain is usually acute. It can be with a rapid onset, um, but abdominal pain is a key one. And then there's always that related uh, signs and symptoms of infection. For example, if there is a perforation, as we mentioned before, in the digestive system, that septicemia will give us signs and symptoms of an infection. Um, but we can also play into a part with the abdominal pain, that nausea and vomiting that can also be associated with it. Moving on to the liver, gallbladder, and pancreas digest diagnostic test, excuse me, um, you'll see the liver function test. This is where we, exactly as it states, we want to look to see, is the liver functioning properly? We'll also get an ultrasound that helps us to evaluate the gallbladder and the pancreas for their size, shape, and position. Um, we can look at x-rays to help us visualize the gallbladder, pancreas, diagnose hepatic and pancreatic cancer. So that's liver and pancreas cancer. Um, I'm sorry, the um, x-ray shows us the presence of gallstones, tumors, functions of the actual gallbladder. I'm sorry, the CAT scan is what allows us to visualize the gallbladder pancreas and to diagnose the hepatic pancreatic cancers. So the CAT scan is what we're going to use when we're looking for cancer. And the x-ray and ultrasound are just giving us visualizations of either gallstones or the gallbladder, liver, and pancreas themselves. When we look at how the aging process can affect these three particular organs, it, it didn't really delve into lots of specifics, but one of the key things is that they're just more prone um, to things like hepatitis because of their decreased immune system. And as you become elderly, whether you live in a, a um, long-term care facility or you have a um, regular hospital stays or doctor's visits, the increased contact with us, the health professionals, um, can sometimes pass on a form of hepatitis to the elderly. Um, and, in, and in combination with their decreased immune system, um, can be very detrimental to their health. Uh, pancreatic diseases, one of the most common is diabetes. Um, we'll talk a little bit more when we get to the endocrine system about why the elderly are um, a bit more susceptible to diabetes um, or pancreatic diseases. And then cirrhosis of the liver um, and, and kind of liver failure is a twofold component. Um, there's the one part that we really can't explain. That's the unknown etiology. Remember that word etiology is the cause. So we really don't know the cause of why um, so many elderly get cirrhosis. Um, but on the other hand, chronic alcohol use, uh, and not as an elderly person, but throughout life can lead um, to cirrhosis. So we definitely have to watch our um, lifestyles, even as young and middle-aged people, because those things can affect us as older adults. And we can see that here. Now looking at the endocrine system's anatomy, again, you can see and you can read the various parts and, and understand their locations just by this picture uh, or the diagram that you see here to the right. Um, but first off, the endocrine system consists of several glands. Um, each gland has its own particular function. All of the glands secrete hormones. Um, there is a table in your text, uh, table 14-1, that does a great job at showing you the gland and also showing you the specific hormones um, that are released by those glands. So if you want to delve more into that portion, I'm going to refer you to table 14-1 for that. But our body has about 30 hormones that are produced by these various glands in our endocrine system. For example, beta cells within the pancreas are secreted and they help to create insulin, which we know controls our blood sugar. So when the beta cells or the pancreas are not functioning properly, that's when we have abnormalities um, in our insulin production or utilization, which can lead us to diabetes, whether it be type one or type two. Um, another key area of hormones that are excreted 
are estrogen and progesterone. Um, any woman who takes a combined birth control pill is taking estrogen and progesterone to alter her ability to reproduce. So those are just a couple of examples um, of specific hormones that are related to our endocrine system um, that I think you could relate to that could bring home that point of not only the endocrine system secreting hormones, but then how those hormones function to help us in preventing disease um, by maintaining their particular homeostasis or their own function, um, if you will. So looking at the signs and symptoms of the endocrine system, they are all related to a hypo or hyper secretion of hormones. So I give you the example of your thyroid. You can have hyperthyroidism or hypothyroidism. Um, it kind of puts you in the mind of how when we talked about the altered mobility in the digestive system, how it can go too fast or too slow. Well, here we can have too many hormones secreted or not enough hormones secreted. And either way, it throws off the function of that particular hormone. The other thing is the difficulty um, to diagnose them. I mean, the, we'll get to which hormones are easy to get to in a minute here, but um, they're just difficult to track because some of the signs and symptoms can be so vague. Uh, for example, with thyroid issues, one of the biggest things could be weight gain or weight loss. So weight gain or weight loss is a vague sign or symptom. So you really can't say, oh, she's gaining too much weight. It must be her thyroid because it doesn't necessarily have to be. Um, it could be uh, increased, you know, thirst or urination. You know, that could be related to insulin production. Um, so really tracking um, the diagnosis is very difficult. So I would say a vague amount of symptoms is a pretty good uh, a pretty good indicator that you might want to look toward the endocrine system. Um, other signs and symptoms that you might see could be mental abnormalities. Um, I just gave the example of the mood or changes in the mood um, because that I think is something that's kind of subtle um, but that can be um, a sign or symptom from the endocrine system not functioning properly, properly, as well as lethargy or fatigue um, and tissue atrophy. Um, tissue atrophy is the shrinking. So let's think about the thyroid gland again. If the thyroid gland is shrinking, um, then you might be able to tell that that thyroid gland is getting smaller, which could pinpoint you um, to look further into that particular diagnosis, um, but the shrinking of the gland itself would be a symptom. Now, as we look to diagnostic tests, so this is what I was referencing before. The testes or the testicles in males and the thyroid gland are the only endocrine glands that can be fully examined. So this goes back to why it is so difficult to uh, pinpoint or track a specific gland as the person's problem um, without a lot of further investigation is because most glands you cannot get to, you cannot examine, you cannot palpate. Um, when you palpate them, that typically says something is wrong. So if example, if there is an enlargement or a shrinking um, of a gland that is palpable, again, that is a way to diagnose, diagnose um, a particular illness. However, a CT scan and an MRI are going to show you these thyroid, these, sorry, <laughs> these glands in particular um, to tell you whether or not they're functioning as they should. And then there are blood and urine tests. Um, I give you the example of the hemoglobin A1C. The hemoglobin A1C is a test that we use to give us the average blood sugar um, for an, an individual person over the course of three months. So if we, your body, this test can allow us to create an average blood sugar. If your blood sugar on average for the last three months has been 250, then it's going to show us that your blood sugar is mostly high. Um, and if it does dip low, it doesn't do it very often, which would help us to diagnose you with diabetes mellitus versus some other illness. And then there are urine tests that just basically help to measure the amount of hormones um, that are secreted or that are responsible for the elimination of some other substance and measuring that can determine whether or not the hormone is actually functioning um, in the way that it should. Okay, and let's look at the aging system for the endocrine system. Basically, the effects of aging are as follows. 
everything decreases. Those 30 hormones that we mentioned before, all having their own individual functions to help our body maintain its homeostasis, all decrease. So what does that put us at risk for? We're at risk for our body not responding to stressors and disease as normal. We're at risk for hypoglycemic reactions, or that's really low blood sugar, um, excessive loss of fluid due to those hormone levels decreasing, reduced secretions of the pancreatic and thyroid hormones, as well as diabetes, which is increased blood sugar because those serum glucose levels rise. So there are two things that you see that are in contrast related to these aging effects of the endocrine system. One is the risk for hypoglycemic reactions, while the other is that they get diabetes mellitus, which we know to be high blood sugar. So the key to um, ensuring that you don't um, fall into the extreme of low or high is that that you see in parentheses, the regulate with the diet. It is very important that the elderly have a well-balanced diet. We know that these hormones are secreted um, on a decreased level as a person ages. So we have to make up for that with their caloric intake, their water, electrolyte, and their fat intake to ensure that we are taking into account the decrease that's happening as a result of them just aging. Um, and all about those 30 hormones that can decrease as they continue to age. So this particular short lecture, um, I purposely did not delve into a lot of the major disorders. I wanted to give you that general overview because there is so much packed into this particular lecture um, and into the reading especially that I wanted to hit those highlights. What you're going to see in practice a lot are the ordering of some of those diagnostic tests. You're going to want to know if I see thyroid, yes, that's the endocrine system that has to do with hormones. Those are some of the dots that I want you to be able to connect. I know it can be overwhelming when there's so much information given to you at one time, but again, I am here to help you. If you do have any questions, even if you want to say, Haley, I need you to slow down. Haley, I need you to explain this more. Feel free to reach out to me by call, uh, text, or even email. Um, I'm always here for your questions. And like I say every week, we'll see you next week in week four.